this one's on for sure. Good morning and welcome to worship today. It is good to see all of you today. We've had a nice reprieve from some of that hot weather and now um, we're in a nice moment. Um, some I've heard over, uh, I heard talking that tomorrow might get jumped back up high again. But let's enjoy the moment and um, know that no matter what the weather is like outside, at least for these moments when we are together, we can embrace the goodness of the Lord and know that all is going to be okay. And we're going to make it through together. So welcome to worship today. It is exciting to see you. Those of you online, welcome for joining us in worship today. As we move through our service today, just a couple announcements to just share with you about some of our life and our ministry together. First, just to remember our schedule this um, month. Um, we were here last week. We'll be here today, obviously. And then the next two weeks, we'll be at our First Presbyterian Church site. And then at the end of the month, we are going to grow it forward which um, is uh, the former site of St. John's UCC and 1501 Marshall. Um, Grow It Forward wants to host us for worship and um, provide a special lunch for us simply um, as a way of just saying thank you for being such a wonderful community partner and all the work that we do and the gifts that we have been able to share with Grow It Forward. Don't uh, forget that on Tuesdays, um, for the next couple weeks, we still have a Bible study on Galatians that Bev Wallace is leading, so you're welcome to join. That's at uh, 9.30, um, right here in this building, um, just around the corner. There'll always be someone to greet you if you're not quite sure what room um, you need to be in. On July 29th, we um, are participating in the first Lakeshore Pride um, event that will be held that Saturday. Um, we have a booth that we've been invited to just share and tell our story a little bit. We need some more volunteers for that, so I'm going to pass this around. If you haven't had a chance to, to volunteer, um, please sign up. There's a couple different jobs. Part of it is just sitting there and, and being that welcoming and smiling face. Um, I won't be able to be there that day, so uh, my family's still not quite back from our family conference. So it really is important to have all of you there in some way um, to represent the church. So we'll just start that here, and as you move around, you can just pass that around. Um, there's also some opportunities if you want to make some fun little baked treats or something that we can hand out, because we all know that food is one way to say how wonderful and, and welcoming um, a place is. And then I think I already mentioned um, on the 30th, um, our service at Grow It Forward. Um, are there other announcements about our life and ministry together that we would want to share today? Then let us continue our worship. Steve. I invite you, if you would, to stand with me in body and or in spirit and join with me as responsively we share our words of gathering. Sometimes we just don't understand what God wants us to do. God calls us to service and freedom and it won't necessarily be an easy life. There is so much that needs to be done. We cannot do it alone. That's the beauty of it. We don't have to do it all. We just have to try and do something to help those in need. Our example will inspire others to service, and so on it goes. Let us worship the Lord. Let us join in singing our opening hymn.
hear these words. The proof of God's radical love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Christ's love, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another as we pray in unison. Holy God, hear our prayer. For the mending of our hearts torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. Through Christ we pray, amen. Hear the words of God's truth. Friends in Christ know this. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and I remind you of this surpassing grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Knowing that we are forgiven, let us take this opportunity to greet one another with the love and the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. As we gather ourselves back together, let us join in singing, We Are Forgiven. be in a spirit of prayer with me. Loving God, 
Help us this morning to hear your words of grace, of challenge, and of peace, and to receive them with humility and obedience. Amen. Today we will hear the radical saying of Jesus that not everyone enters the kingdom. Listen for the Spirit in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Jesus said, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. On the judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and do lots of miracles in your name? Then I'll tell them, I've never known you. Get away from me, you people who do wrong. The word of the Lord. So our passage this morning is perhaps one of the scariest passages we might hear in Scripture. And it comes directly from the lips of Jesus. Jesus has said, or actually, let's go back. Jesus has just finished telling, if we are to read some of the pretext to this, Jesus has just finished telling his disciples to beware of false prophets. In fact, Jesus describes them as ravenous wolves that clothe themselves in, in a sheep's covering. So they look innocent and they look helpful, but they're not. These are the false prophets. They are people who are purposefully imposters. They're trying to get us confused and to make us walk in the wrong path. They're posing as someone who they're not. But I think some of the scariness of today's passage is that today, or in this passage, Jesus is talking about a different type of people. It's not those who are deceived by a false prophet, but it is those who are deceived by their own thinking. These are the people who think they are disciples of Jesus, but they aren't. They're people who think they know what God wants, but then they find out on that great judgment day that God doesn't know them at all. And this, I think, is exactly why this text is so scary. The idea that there are people out there who believe that they know God and believe that they are doing all the right things to find out that they're not actually known by God. It's scary because those people could be you and me, that we think we're doing all the right things, but somehow Jesus says, get away. You don't really belong here. And then to compound it, Jesus says in verse 21 that the defining mark of the one who is deceived is that they're not living the will of God. So they can say, Lord, Lord, they can call upon Jesus, they can memorize John 3.16, they can know all the old hymns of the church, they can attend worship every day, but Jesus says they don't really do my will. We have a phrase for that in today's world. They, they might talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. 
scary. Could be you and me. There are those who believe that they will be saved, but then Jesus says, hold on. I never knew you. Get away from me. That's pretty scary. But the radicalness that Jesus is saying here is what I want to focus on today, not necessarily the fear part, because I think as we talk about why this statement is so radical, some of the fear may disappear a little bit. But first I want you to notice the connection between what this, let's just call them, this group of people call Jesus and how Jesus describes them. We're told that they call out, Lord, Lord. Now, if we look through the Bible and the Hebrew scriptures as well as our New Testament, we see that often whenever a name or a title is repeated, it's usually with a sign of affection. Like you might say to a child or a grandchild, and you might repeat their name twice or so, just getting their attention, but also a sign of endearment. They call out, Lord, Lord. They're attributing with that title power and authority and influence to Jesus. They're calling Jesus the master and the ruler of their life. So they seem like they earnestly believe that they're doing the right thing. Yet Jesus points out that even though they say that they are followers, that they're somehow refusing to actually live the gospel. That somehow they're going through all the motions, but they're not actually doing the will of God, the gospel of God, still just sits there. Maybe you know some people like that, who on Sunday mornings, they're the best Christians you could ever have, but then an hour or so later, they go out to lunch and they treat the wait staff at the restaurant like garbage. They get on the road and they can't wait to just cut somebody off. And maybe even show them some hand gesture when they're not doing their way. They seem to know that they can call Jesus Lord, but they don't really seem to be living the gospel. At least not when they're away from the watchful eye of their church family. I can imagine Jesus in today's world saying some things perhaps... They will come and they will say, Jesus, we built you giant churches and we filled them with thousands of people. And Jesus will say to them, I've never known you. Get away from me. They will come and they will say, Jesus, we packed Christmas boxes for the African children and we went on mission trips. And we prayed loudly, and Jesus will say, I've never known you. Get away from me. They will come and they will say, Jesus, we've given bunches of money and we've paid our pastor enough to buy a jet airplane, all because you have blessed us so much. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Get away from me. And they'll say, but Jesus, we have the best choir in town, and we've got a praise band, and we hold revivals. And Jesus will say, I've never known you. Get away from me. They'll say, Jesus, we've opened coffee shops, and we've made movies and music all in your name. And Jesus will say, I've never known you. Get away from me. That can hurt. So many of the things that we like to think about are our golden tickets to church growth. Jesus might look right at us and say, get away. You've never really 
known me. We can do all of these things in the name of Jesus, and still Jesus can say, I don't know you. And here, I think, is where the radicalness of this saying comes in, because Jesus is saying that our love for God isn't enough to save us. Our love for God isn't what saves us. The things we do in Jesus' name aren't the things that save us. Our theological beliefs that we hold are not the things that save us. And as long as we go through this life thinking that our actions and our choices somehow manipulate God into loving us and therefore somehow saving us, we are fooled. And the truth is not in us. For Jesus is saying that if we think that we are in charge of our own salvation or in charge of anybody else's salvation for that matter, we don't really get the gospel. We don't really know about the gospel. And so he says, not everyone who cries out my name, not everybody who does things in my name will necessarily enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, when Jesus says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will get into heaven. I want to be clear here. I don't think he's making a systematic theological statement that simply says that there are those people who I like and they get in and there are people I don't like and they don't get in. That's too simplistic. And when we combine it with the text coming before about false prophets and some of the texts that have come after, it makes it clear that Jesus here is making a clear statement that he wants us to live the gospel with our lives, not just with our lips. Jesus is saying that if we want to get to heaven, we need to embrace the God love, if you will, that is already inside of us. You see, our salvation comes not because of what we've done, but because God has said, I love you. God has said, I have chosen you. You are worthy. And for that reason, the kingdom of heaven is yours. It's not about what we do. It's not about earning our way into heaven. It's not about being better than somebody else. It's about whether we simply say, God, thank you for being inside of me. And then, out of gratitude, we may do all those other things. Not as an attempt to get something out of God, not as an attempt to manipulate God, but simply as saying, God, because I am love, my heart overflows, and I just want to do these things. Now, friends, I know, I know that you are probably struggling with these forms of these questions all the time, because I do too. Am I good enough? Has God, or have I loved God enough? Does my life display discipleship enough? And we worry and we wonder about whether we're going to get into heaven. That's normal because that's the world we live in, folks. That's the culture we live in. We live in this transactional world that says no one would just give us something for free. That no one would just love us unless we somehow butter them up first. That's the world we live in. But God isn't about transactional love. God is about transformational love. God isn't worried about whether you're good enough because honestly, God already knows that none of us are. So God has simply said, 
I call you by name. And I love you. Now we can call that grace. And then the Apostle Paul in the New Testament wants to remind us that the grace of Christ is sufficient for every single one of us. So that's all. It's not really all that scary when we hear these words. Because, again, Jesus isn't shaking the finger and saying, get out of here. Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those of you who are languishing in loneliness and fear. Come to me. All are invited into the kingdom of God. And then, of course, the question always comes, how do we know that we are saved? Well, the old classical answer from the 1500s is, is that we can't ever know if we are saved. But what we do know is that we are loved in this moment, in this space, and therefore, in gratitude, we live our lives for God's love right here and right now. Now, there can be signs because Jesus says that you'll do my will. So just maybe, just maybe we've got to turn this whole church thing upside down for a little bit. And maybe church growth isn't really what it's all about. Maybe we're not really striving to simply have these giant, what they used to call mega churches. Maybe that's turned the gospel upside down. Maybe Jesus didn't say, well, not maybe, Jesus never said, go out and build a giant church. Jesus never said, make sure that your church has all the most beautiful things in it. Jesus never said, make sure your church has the best choir and the best preacher. Jesus never said, make sure you're covered on a couple news channels every Sunday morning. Jesus never said those kinds of things. You know what Jesus said. You know what Jesus is talking about when Jesus says, live the gospel. When we spend time with the outcasts, when we spend time with the persecuted, when we are imitating Christ, we are doing the will of the gospel. When we spend time with those that our culture might define as sinners, maybe even our own heart defines them as sinners, but when we spend time with them, we imitate Christ. When we spend time feeding the hungry and housing the homeless and visiting the sick and the imprisoned, then we are in accord with the will of God, the gospel. When we speak up for justice and equity and righteousness, then, friends, we are doing the will of God. When we sacrifice our own comfort for the needs of others, then we are doing the will of God. When we love for the sake of the other and not as some manipulative way to earn God's salvation, then we are living the will of God. Everything else about our church life are the things that might be added to us. They are not the purpose. The purpose of our faith is not to be noticed but to love. This is what we have been called to do. So yes, Jesus says that horrible phrase, not everybody enters the kingdom, but it's not because people aren't good enough, no one's good enough. It's because that some people just have chosen to only wear the clothing of the lamb when their hearts remain that of the wolf. 
It's because some only want the trappings of the faith. And they don't want to do the hard work. It's because some just like to have a place to be married and buried from, but they don't really want to do the hard work of discipleship. For those people, they may end up saying, oh, the kingdom is too much for me. I don't think I can do that anymore. But friends, you and I, because you came today, because you are listening today, I know that together we are striving to embrace the Christ who already loves us, who has already saved us, and who is already alive within us. Together with the help of one another, we can call out and we can say, Jesus is Lord, and then Jesus will say to us, well done, thy good and faithful servants. Not because we're perfect, but because we're striving because we have chosen to put the gospel first. So you and me, we have choices to make each and every day. We can choose to simply call Jesus Lord and get all the benefits that we see on this earth, but not actually let Christ know us and love us. Or we can choose to do the work of the gospel out of gratitude, not to prove anything, but simply to say thank you. So friends, let God save you. God is already here. <coughs> God has already called your name. God has already said, you are mine. And nothing in this life or the life that is yet to come. No powers, no principalities, no laws, no governments can ever separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ. No matter what you do in the name of Jesus, it's not going to get you saved because you have been saved simply because God says, I love you. So friends, don't be afraid about where you're going. Just take stock of your own life and know that the kingdom is before you. Let those who have ears hear let those who have hearts listen. For the word of the Lord has been shared today. Let the people say amen. Friends, let us stand and join together in singing our hymn, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. with your love show us how to serve the name 
neighbors we have from you. These are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. He puts us on our knees, showing us faith by our needs, serving the neighbors we have from you. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of our friends, silently washes their feet. This is the way we should live with you. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have. Please be seated. We come to an intentional time of prayer today. So I ask, do any of you have any special prayers that you wish to lift up today? Yes, Holly. Okay, Brenda's having a brain MRI on Wednesday, and we pray that the results of that will give the necessary answers to correct all of those things. Yes. So, to pray for Alice, who's having some breathing issues. Yes. Katie? Yes. Katie having kidney surgery on Wednesday, so we lift that up in prayers. Yes. Prayers for Carrie Gerlock and family as they go through a number of medical issues right now. Yes, Julie. Prayers for Vincent as he's uh, um, as he's traveling, so he can see. Yes, Ann. Amen and amen. Prayers for peace all around the world, and as the old song says. Let it begin with us, right? And then let it grow out from there. Uh, okay. Um, Amy, Amy asked for prayers for her dog, for, for healing and that, and the strength to cope with all of that being a, uh, a parent even to a pet tent. And as I'm thinking about your family, Jim, how's your son doing with his cancer? Okay. Okay. Continue to pray for Jesse's um, healing. Other prayers we particularly wish to name at this moment. So I know in, a, in our bulletin there's a list of other prayers there that um, in names of people and situations. But let us join our hearts together now in prayer. Holy God, in the midst of this day of worship, we come before you knowing that we are not perfect in following your will that we make mistakes, but that you are also there, and that by your love you're able to pick us up, and all we need to do is simply welcome your embrace. You are already here, surrounding us. You have heard our prayers here, prayers for healing, prayers for hope in the midst of such a crazy world. So come, Lord, 
and bring your healing to all the names that have been mentioned, to all those who remain in our hearts. Bring your peace to rain down upon this creation of yours. Let it begin in our hearts and let us move outward. Help us, Lord, to follow your will, to love who you love, to forgive who you, ha you have forgiven. Help us not to seek glory, not to compare ourselves to others, but to be satisfied that your grace is in us. And however you call us and move us and direct us, it is sufficient for living in the beloved community, the kingdom of heaven. Lord, in the midst of this summer, we pray for all those who are traveling, for those who are embarking on new adventures, for those who are seeking jobs, for those who are contemplating education, for those going on family vacations, for those who are going on their spiritual walkabouts, we pray. You will always be in the forefront of their mind. And Lord, we pray no less for those of us who stay put during these summer months. For the journey of the heart and the mind is just as powerful as the journey of the body. So come, Lord Jesus, now in the stillness of these moments and let us feel your power in new and unique ways. Let us know that you are in us. Now, O oh God, our hearts are already joined, and we join our voices together. And we pray the prayer that you first taught the disciples and that has been passed on from generation to generation, that we learn from parents and grandparents, from Sunday school teachers and preachers. We pray the Lord's Prayer using whatever words, translations, version that speaks from our hearts to you. Hear us as we pray with one heart and one mind. Our Father, our Mother in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray with our hearts and with our souls. We also pray with our generosity and our gifts. We have the opportunity today to share our offerings with the larger body of faith, the community that we live and move within. In addition to our regular offerings this month, the month of July, we are collecting school supplies for children in our community that might be struggling, whose families can't always get what they need. So as those sales begin to happen around you, I encourage you to go out and to buy some supplies, whether that be pencils or erasers or pens, whatever it may be. Bring them to wherever we're worshiping on Sunday. Bring them to the office in the middle of the week and we'll share those with Can Cool Back to School as they have their giveaway in later August. But if you can't quite get out and get those things and maybe you want to give a financial gift, they're happy to take those as well. It's just another way that we connect with our community and we recognize that not everyone has the same privileges that you and I do. And we want to make sure that every child is able to begin the school year with all the things they need to have a successful education. 
So again, if you're able to give beyond your regular offering, do so this month for them and for our community. As you wish to share your offerings, in just a minute we're going to have some special music and you're invited to come while Dolores sings to bring your offering here to this plate to put it in there and to simply remember you are loved and that you are worthy and that we give in gratitude because all that God has first given to us. So friends, let us come and let us share the fruit of our labors and let God's beloved kingdom be known. When we been here ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to see. Holy and magnificent God, who is also our friend, who stands in solidarity with us through the struggles of this life, we dedicate our very lives and these offerings to the building up of the beloved community. Bless us and multiply these gifts so that your words may be known, that your love may be known. And we wait for that day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess. You are the Lord of Lords, that you are the Prince of Peace, you are the Savior of Souls. Amen. Friends, if you are able, I invite you to stand for our blessing today. As is our custom, I invite you to put one palm out facing upward as a sign that we are the receiver of God's blessing. With the other hand, I invite you to put your palm outward as a sign that we are also the giver of God's blessings in this world. And hear these words. 
whatever you do in word or deed, proclaim the glory of God. Claim God's love in your life and know that the face of God shines upon you, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you and that the community of the Holy Spirit binds us together as one people today and always. Let us go forth in love and peace. Alleluia. Amen. We go out singing, Go Now in Peace.